If you have a Bible, open up to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. This is not uh, as long probably a teaching as you all are used to. I know some of you are gravely disappointed. <laughs> we'll, we'll bear with this, get through this together, this shorter, shorter version of a teaching. But Jeremiah 29, some things that, that I believe the Lord would say to us here at the end of the year, at the beginning uh, of the new year, and maybe some words of encouragement for all of us. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 1. Now these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile, the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the court officials, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent... By the hand of Elessa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, the son or king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and because... And become the fathers of sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for its welfare. You will, for in its welfare you will have welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you and do not listen to the dreams which they dream. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Father, I recognize these words were spoken by you through the prophet Jeremiah, written down in letter form. Lord, some 2,600 years ago or so, to a people exiled. We recognize, Lord, these words you sent to your people in exile, to your captives, as, as a word of encouragement to them. Now, Father, I pray that we might, as grafted in believers in Jesus, that we might benefit from these words this morning. And I, I do believe, Lord, you have a word for us. Would you speak your word to our hearts today? And encourage your people, Lord, even as you have encouraged me in these words, that we might lift up our heads, knowing our time of redemption is drawing near, and recognize how we are to live in this world. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. December 30th, 2012. It still blows my mind, and I say this often. I know it's, it's just amazing to me how fast time barrels forward. And right now, once again, we are on the crest of a brand new year. And i got to admit to you that I have been more hopeful in past years. You know, approaching New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, I've had kind of a, an excitement as to what was going to happen or where we were going to go this year, and, and often that's been my attitude. And, and over the last several weeks at least, I've been oppressed. In fact, our staff, we, we had a final staff meeting back before the Christmas Eve service, and, and we were sharing, each one of us were feeling just a heavy weight on us. And began to pray about those things and realize, you know, sometimes that happens for all of us. And sometimes the enemy will oppress us. Sometimes life itself will become oppressive. And sometimes we just look around at the world around us and we think, ah, oh, boy, you know, how much longer, Lord? The psalmist felt that way. How long, O oh Lord? And I, I was thinking again about these things when I came to Jeremiah 29. And the thoughts that are in my head right now and granted, it's because we're on the crest of the year, but it's where are we, really? Where are we going? You know, will this year see this country barreling over the fiscal cliff, as it's been coined? Will we go over or will we go up to meet Jesus in the sky this year? Far my preference. Will this be a year of, of turnaround, of revival, of restoration 
in America or a year of deepening dismay and oppression. And perhaps you've been wondering some of these same things. Proverbs 14.34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Ephesians 5.15, Paul wrote, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. And truly they are. We live in dark and, and evil times. And so, like many of you, I watch these things. And I pray about these things. And I, I read and I consider where we're at as a people, as a country, uh, as believers in Christ, as a fellowship. I wonder at the changing landscape in our country, as we've talked about much recently. I mean, this is our nation. This is our, our home on earth. And like many of you, one of the questions I've pondered over the years again and again, specifically related to Bible prophecy, is this. Where is America in the end time scenario? Where is America in the last days? We see in the Bible, we see Israel you know, very clearly present and God working through and in and for his people Israel in the last of the last days. We see Iran. Persia is a major player. We see Russia, the bear, along with many Middle Eastern countries and Eastern Europe and Turkey and even the Far East, we see at play in the end times. We don't seem to see America. And there are those who have pointed to Revelation 12, the wings of the great eagle were given to her to lift her into a safe place. And and some have guessed that perhaps America is going to provide some great airlift to Israel in their time of need. And others have said, well, we see ships from the West. Maybe that's what America is doing, sending ships from the West. And yet, try as I might, and believe me, I have tried. I don't see America in the last days. Not as a great world leader. Not as a country through which international things flow. I don't see it. We read all of these other nations. We'll read about them when we get to Ezekiel, Lord willing. Uh, We see them in the book of Revelation. We see them throughout Scripture referred to and mentioned. We saw in Isaiah these different nations. But I ask the question again. Where is the greatest nation on earth? In the history of the world, America stands as the greatest nation nation that has ever stood where are we Israel was that nation once Israel was at one time the greatest nation on earth rising to greatness under King David and then passed along to Solomon who was a great leader and the kingdom spread out and there was amazing peace under King Shlomo (laughs) King Shalom, King of Peace. Solomon stood as an example of that. Vast, untold wealth, influence, size. It was a great nation on earth. But then things started to go bad. United they stood. Divided they fell. And as we watch our Congress deal with this fiscal cliff issue, that comment has come up a few times this last week. Look how divided we are as a country. United we stand. Divided we fall. After Solomon's reign, remember his son, Rehoboam, decided to increase taxes on the people. And in so doing, to put a heavy weight on the people, and the kingdom split into the north and the south. Jeroboam taking northern Israel, the ten northern tribes, and Rehoboam hanging on to the two southern tribes And so he ended up with two kingdoms where once there was one. God still looked at all Israel as his people. But from man's perspective, there was now the southern kingdom of Judah, the northern kingdom of Israel. And from that point forward, it is downhill. We went through 1st and 2nd Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Kings. We saw this downward spiral of this once great nation coming to its final demise. The northern kingdom of Israel decimated by Assyria. You Bible students know the date. 722 B.C. Northern Israel was wiped off the map and would be no more. And the southern kingdom would follow 
Less than a couple hundred years later, taken into captivity in Babylon. 2 Kings 23, 27, the Lord said, I will remove Judah also from my sight, as I have removed Israel. And I will cast off Jerusalem, this city which I have chosen, and the temple of which I said, my name shall be there. God spoke those words upon the death of Josiah. And Josiah was truly the last decent king. In Israel, he was the last king to spur revival, uh, to stir a restoration and a repentance among the people, taking down the high places of pagan worship and returning the heart of the people to God as their father, Josiah, good king Josiah. He was the last best hope of Judah. And after he died in battle, well, there would be a few others. Four kings would follow him. His sons The one immediately after him would reign an entire huge three months before he was taken out. And within three decades of Josiah, Jerusalem was destroyed and the people carried off into Babylonian captivity. Think about that. From great revival to destruction, 30 years. That's all it took. And finally in my life I can see that 30 years is a blip. 30 years goes by very quickly. It was during this time, literally a a 40-year or so process of decay, that God raised up a prophet for his people, and the prophet's name was Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Now, we're going to get rolling with Jeremiah next Sunday, so I'm not going to say a whole lot about him right now. We'll get into the introduction and talk about the prophet and what God was doing and what was happening with the people. But understand this, that across the 40 years of Jeremiah's ministry, he goes from Josiah to seeing the destruction of the kingdom, to seeing his people hauled off into Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah himself would not go to Babylon. Ezekiel would. He is the prophet who is called to be in Babylon and to prophesy from Babylon. But Jeremiah would not be taken out. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, some have said would sit on the Mount of Olives and watch Jerusalem burn to the ground. And that would be the conclusion of his ministry. How would you like to sign up for that? I thought about it as a pastor. How would I like that? You know, to come into, say, a church. Say I got hired in a church of 5,000 people. Proud to be part of something big. And I single-handedly took that church down to nothing. I mean, that's what happened for Jeremiah. He came into a people who under Josiah were in revival and things were good. Called it a good time. But he would watch his people spiral into nothing during his ministry. He would be told at one point, oh, I said I wouldn't say anything about Jeremiah yet. I have to tell you this. <laughs> he would be told by the Lord at one point, don't pray for the people anymore. Boy, you know it's bad when God tells a pastor or a prophet, stop praying for the people. Things were bad. He's called the weeping prophet. And indeed, he wrote Lamentations. But before we open the book for study, Lord willing, next week, I want to jump ahead and look at the message here in chapter 29, briefly this morning. Go back to verse 1 and think these things through with me. These are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile, the priests, the prophets, all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Uh, This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the court of officials, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by... The hand of Elisa, the the son of of Shaphan, and Gamariah, the son of Hilkiah, and Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. So this letter is sent across to Babylon by messengers. Zedekiah at the time, the last king of Israel, poor king, a puppet king really, set up by Nebuchadnezzar to rule there in Israel. Zedekiah is sending men to, you know, deal with Nebuchadnezzar. To bring tribute, to to try and and appease him. And so among these men who were sent, a letter is sent by Jeremiah from the Lord to his people. And Jeremiah 29 is that letter. Now you need to understand the Babylonian captivity that we're going to be talking about in, in coming days here. It came in three waves. It didn't just happen at once. Nebuchadnezzar first attacked the kingdom of Judah in 605 B.C. and took a group of people into exile. 
In 597 B.C., second wave, he would come again and take more of the princes and leaders and rulers and, and the craftsmen. And that's what we're talking about here, the people taken off into exile at that point. That's the second wave. And finally, there would be the complete destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. So three waves. This letter, Jeremiah 29, was written and sent after the second wave, but before the third wave. So there are still people living in Judah. Judah is still considered a kingdom, though again a puppet kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. And so this letter goes out. Ever feel like you're in that place? You got one foot in the security of your nation and another foot in exile. One foot in hope that somehow you're going to survive and the other foot knowing you're not. Standing kind of on both. Ever feel like we've got one foot in the security of America and another foot heading off into captivity? I think that's right where we are in our country. In fact, I think the timing of studying Jeremiah is very interesting for where we are as a people. Especially Christians. Man, I've got one foot in the world and one foot ready to leap. You ever do that? You ever get in rapture-ready stance? (laughs) Perhaps you're having a particularly bad day or maybe a particularly good day and you just kind of squat down and go, Okay, Lord... I'm going to jump and let's just keep going. (laughs) And there are times I feel that way, that that tension of of literally exile in the world. This is not my home. I feel like an exile here, a foreigner. Yeah, I'm a citizen of America. Yes, I love this country, but I feel at times like an exile. With my other foot, wanting to be home. Again, try as I have, I don't see America anywhere in end times prophecy. It used to disturb me because I would think, well, what about my country? What about the role that we play? I certainly don't see America as a major player. And I think really what this means is that America is going to go one of two ways, up or down. Up or down. Either we're going to go down into decay like every great nation in the history of the world has. And by the way, the average lifespan of a nation is about 250 years. So we're coming to the end of the average lifespan of a typical nation throughout history. Will America continue down? Or will America go up? And when I say go up, I, I wonder if the reason that we are not seen, obviously, in last day's end times prophecy is that a vast number of people in this country are about to go up to meet Jesus in the sky. Let me tell you some good news. Conservative scholarly polling in this country tells us that fully 45% of Americans still claim the deity of the resurrection, and the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm talking specifically. You can look at different polls, USA Today polls, things like that, that'll say roughly 85, 88% of Americans believe in God. You know, you can look at those generic polls. But when you get down to specific polling, what do you really believe? There's still 45% of Americans, according to this research, if it's correct, that believe... Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, who have taken Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And maybe we have differences of theology and differences in doctrine and and some watered down and some over the top and some legalistic, but there are still 45% of Americans who believe, have faith in Jesus, a faith unto salvation. That's not bad news. It's not as much as I would like. Maybe it's not as much as it's been, but 45%, this means that out of 315 million Americans, 141,750,000 people would, by His grace, be caught up instantly when He calls. What will that do to this country? I think in comparison to other countries, you could say, hey, you know, this, this is going to happen across the board, right? What about the underground church in China? They're all going to go. 
you know, what about the church that, that is that is moving in the in the in the homes and in hidden places in Iran? They're going to go. Won't this affect all countries in the world? First Corinthians fifteen fifty one, where Paul says, "I tell you a mystery: we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed." And I think if 45% of America was gone, instantly, caught up, raptured, that would decimate this country. We would instantly go from being a first world country to a third world nation. I mean, just in a, in a blip. Again, what about other countries? China or Russia or other great countries? Listen. I don't think it would happen the same in other countries. Not that there wouldn't be a great number of people saved. And by the way, the wonderful thing about God's grace is far more people are going to be saved than we think should be. (laughs) I've got my list. And of course, I'm on it. But there are going to be people in heaven that will shock you. And there are going to be people in heaven that will be shocked to see you. (laughs) You made it. God is gracious. But we yet in America have Christians at all levels of leadership. We still in America have Christians in Washington. We still in America have Christians leading in greatly influential Positions. Take them out, and you got a problem. Other countries, Christians don't enjoy positions of leadership like they do here still. Other countries wouldn't see such a great change. Oh, there would be a, a great lessening of population, to be sure. But China, for example, Christianity and leadership, at the time of the rapture, you're not going to see a whole lot of the Chinese leadership Disappearing, Rick, that's awfully judgmental. I'm just saying. (laughs) I'm just calling it as as I see it. And again, could I be wrong? Absolutely. But gang, some of these other countries, though, having hundreds of thousands of Christians underground, would get along just fine leadership wise, whereas America still in this day would be decimated. So either we're going down, and that's why America is not part of the end time scenario. Or so many are going up that America will not be part of the end times scenario. Either way, we don't see much America. So what do we do with that? What what do you and this is really where I, what I wanted to get to this morning. God's message to the exiles of Judah can be taken, though it was intended for them, can be the same message for American Christians today. For you and me today, going into 2013, wondering how long we actually have here, for in this passage, God answers for us, I believe, the question, how should we now live? How do we live until our earthly exile is over? Follow this through briefly with me. Verse 4, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them and plant gardens and eat their produce. Man, that doesn't sound like a prison sentence. That's amazing. God is exiling His people Sending them off into captivity to be disciplined for their disobedience, for their idolatry, for their paganism. And he says to them, now that they're there, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, eat their produce. Take wives. Become the fathers of sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there. And do not decrease. Don't fall apart. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. All right, a couple of things to note. Number one, this word for welfare here in verse 7. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. The word in the Hebrew is shalom. It's peace. Seek the peace of the city where I have sent you into exile. 
first thing that we can do as American Christians today be at peace. Just be at peace. I needed to hear this word this week. Be at peace. Romans 12, 18, Paul said, If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. And this should be one of the hallmarks of Christian living. Be at peace. Not ranting and raving against the sin and depravity of our country. I'll do that. You, no, I'm kidding. I have a tendency to do that. And I will confess to you, it's very easy to do that. And it's very easy to get upset about the things we see going on in the world. This whole fiscal crisis in America, man, it's easy to get worried about that. How's this going to affect us? Why can't they just get along? What's the problem? (laughs) And off we go. And I'll tell you what, the 24-hour news cycle does not promote peace of any kind. (laughs) It's quite the opposite. And the thing that concerns me about that is we watch so much of it that we are beginning to think and behave that way. That we are beginning to be more contentious and argumentative and forcing our point of view rather than being at peace with one another. Peace is a peace is a fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace. It's number three on the list. Be at peace. God tells the exiles: build, plant, marry, multiply. Do not decrease. Again, it's amazing. There's grace in discipline. He says, "Okay, you're here now. Don't give up. I haven't given up on you." I've sent you here, yes, for a season, for a time. You're going to be here. And while you're here, be at peace. Christian brothers and sisters, there is no reason that we can't, until Jesus comes, celebrate, rejoice, enjoy life, build, plant, marry, multiply, until Jesus comes. No reason. Young couples who have said, well, I just don't know if we should marry because Jesus may come and maybe we should just put that off until he comes, you know, and not go down that road at all. No, get married and celebrate that marriage. What if it's only for a week? It'll be one great week. (laughs) Should we have children and bring a child into this world? Yeah, don't decrease. You keep living in peace, but don't hoard that peace. Don't hoard that peace. What do you mean? Secondly, be at prayer. Be at peace, be at prayer. Look how verse 7 continues. He says, pray to the Lord on its behalf for its peace, in its peace or welfare. You will have peace. Whose peace? Babylon's. Now, you Bible students, you know this. Psalm 122 tells us, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But here we have the Lord saying, pray for the peace of Babylon. Wow. Pray for the peace of Babylon. Because as Babylon knows peace, my people, the Lord says, so you will know peace. Yeah, but it's Babylon. It's pagan. It's off the charts. They don't allow manger scenes in the public square. They don't view the Ten Commandments the way we do. They're going down the wrong path. Pray for its peace. And I would say pray for the peace of America. Don't stop praying for the country. Don't give up on the country. For as this country knows peace, you will know peace. We will have peace as we pray for the peace of our country. Wait a minute, Rick, are you comparing America to Babylon? Hey, if the idolatry fits. (laughs) But we pray for the peace of the place in which we are in exile. An Iranian Christian should do the same thing for their country. Pray for the peace of Iran. A Syrian Christian should be praying for the peace of Syria. And so should we as well. But here's the thing. Be at peace. Be at prayer. Be constant in our prayer for this nation. For our neighbors. For our fellow citizens. Be in that place of prayer for their peace. 
this great country in which we live, it's not my home. I'm just a passing through. I get to live here. I get to be a part of it. Oh, for 70 years or so. You know, 80, 90 if I'm extra healthy. Or if God hasn't determined to take me before that. The people would be 70 years in Babylon. I think that's interesting. The people would be a lifetime, average lifetime in Babylon. And God says during that average lifetime, I want you to be at peace and be a prince. And so I think about myself. Okay, what if I have 70 years here? Should the Lord allow? What am I going to do with that? I believe it's my solemn responsibility as a citizen of heaven to be at peace and to be at prayer. This Thursday night, you're all invited, by the way. This Thursday night, January 3rd, and I haven't run this by the other shepherds. I hope they will indulge me in this. But I I sent out an email to them a few days ago saying, would you join me in, in prayer and fasting on January 3rd? for our meeting that evening. Let's get up that morning and let's spend the day praying for for God to really give us some direction. You know, where does he want us to go? What do we what are we doing as a fellowship? Where is he leading us? And it struck me yesterday in thinking about these things that this is not just a discussion for the shepherds, it's a discussion for all of us. And so you're invited. And I ask you if you are free Thursday night, seven o'clock, be here at the barn. We're going to pray. And we're going to pray for God's leadership, God's leading as the chief shepherd of this fellowship as to what we're supposed to be about. Is there something we're missing? Is there something that God wants us to be aware of and think about as we head into this next year and however however long he has for us? So that invitation, it goes out to all of you. Um, Please consider Thursday night to come join us here in the barn and pray together and see what God has for us. 7 o'clock Thursday night. Be at peace. Be at prayer. Verse 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you and do not listen to the dreams which they dream. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. Number three, be perceptive. Be perceptive. In other words, be discerning in these days. And this is absolutely serious. There are false prophets galore out there right now, both within the church and without. Within the church, there are religious false prophets that are inviting the church to soften God's standards of righteousness. And it is false teaching to do so. To turn away from the truth of Scripture... In favor of grace alone. Remember, Jesus Christ came in grace and truth. And the two function perfectly together. But when we wipe out one or the other, that's where we're in trouble. Grace and truth. There are those who claim we as a church will conquer the world and set up the kingdom and then hand it over to Christ as if we could. And Jesus said very clearly, and we saw it in Mark 13, verse 5, See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will mislead many. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But take heed, behold, I have told you everything in advance. So both now and in times of tribulation, Jesus is saying, false prophets will arise. Be perceptive. Be discerning. But let me say this to you, gang. There are false prophets outside the church as well, and they are luring us like crazy. And sometimes we don't think about it that way because we think as long as, you know, if it's false prophets, it's false teaching us within the church. So I just got to be careful with church stuff and how the Bible is being taught. Outside the church, it doesn't matter so much. Wow. Gang, anyone... Or anything who replaces your passion for Jesus is a false teacher. Whether they're talking religion or not. Anyone who would distract you from the gospel call on your life. Be careful with that. Don't listen to them. Let Jesus be first in all things. Be perceptive. Keep your eyes wide open. In these days in which we live. Paul said in Romans 16 verse 17. I urge you brethren. Keep your eye on those who cause dissensions. And hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned. And turn away from them. For such men are slaves not of our Lord Christ. But of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. So be at peace. Be at prayer. Be perceptive. And finally. Lastly. Be prepared. Be prepared, verse 10. 
For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I love how this rings here, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And God would say to Israel, I'm going to bring you back. I'm bringing you back into this land that I gave you, back into this place that I made for you. Now, I'm not trying to read into prophecy any more than was intended here, but again, for those of us who are heirs of the promise, who are grafted in, I believe the Lord speaks to us today, be prepared. You are here right now for a season. You are here for a time. It will not go on forever. This world is going to pass away. This nation will not stand. This barn is going to burn. But I will visit you. And I will come back to you again. And I will fulfill my good word to you, the Lord, I believe, says to us. I will bring you back to this place. What place? John 14, 3, Jesus said, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Man, I need to be reminded of that. You could read me those words, John 14, 3, every single day, and it would not be too much. To be reminded that Jesus is going to visit us, and He is going to bring us back to the place that He has prepared for us. Gang, our lives are not about saving America. Our lives are about being used as tools of the Lord to see as many people in America saved as possible. But our life is not about saving the country. Our life is not about saving the planet. As if we could. Be at peace. Be at prayer. Be spiritually perceptive. Be prepared. Why? Because Jesus said very clearly, John 18, 36, My kingdom is is not of this world. We're exiles here for a time, for a season. As long as we're here, man, build, plant, marry, enjoy, rejoice, celebrate, be at peace, pray, be perceptive, and most of all, be prepared. 